May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. So there is a, uh, there are two characters that seem to come up a lot this time of year. Um, one of them is almost always comically portrayed in every Christmas pageant, and that is Herod the Great, uh, the king of, of Judea who was alive when Jesus was born and died around the year 4 AD. Uh, the other figure is John the Baptist, who we encountered last week. Um, at the beginning of his ministry, and this gospel captures uh, close to the end of his ministry before he was, he was executed when he was in prison. But I want, I want us this morning to take part in or explore the conversation that these three figures, uh, Herod the Great and his, to a degree his, his son, Herod Antipas, who was alive when uh, John the Baptist was alive, and, and it was Herod... King Herod, the great son that had uh, John the Baptist executed. Uh, the tradition of Herod as ruler and leader of Judea. The tradition of John the Baptist as uh, someone who many people believed would be a prophet who would herald the end and destruction of Herod's reign. And Herod himself was so afraid of that he had him executed. And finally, of Jesus of Nazareth. What's fascinating about this conversation is the conversation, in a way, starts all the conversation points um, are stated by Herod. Uh, a lot of the things, a lot of the themes in the gospel, in a way, are responding to the things that he was doing. He was, uh, he was Jewish, but he wasn't from Judea, so a lot of Pharisees didn't think he was really Jewish. He was from Galilee. And uh, he was a ruler of Galilee before he became uh, king of Judea. Just like Jesus, he made a journey from Galilee to Jerusalem to be king. Like Jesus, he was declared king of the Jews by the Roman Senate. He had a very scandalous divorce. Uh, he banished his wife along with his three-year-old son to marry somebody that he thought was more attractive. And his son, Herod Antipas, had a similar scandalous divorce that led to a war, a rather brutal war. Uh, so we can already see there's a conversation that happens where Jesus is very, very anti-divorce. And some Christians have sort of wrestled with that. What is Jesus meaning? And, yet, and we have this conversation. Um, there was a war that had happened very recently in Jesus' time as the result of a divorce that was approved by the Pharisees because he would have followed all the Jewish laws about issuing a certificate of divorce, right? He ruled Jerusalem for 34 years. He was the king of Jerusalem because Caesar Augustus gave him that authority. So we have a king being given authority by a god. In the Roman Empire, this would be Caesar Augustus. And we have Christ the king being made king by the Lord. He was a great builder. That was one of the big things. The reason why he's Herod the Great is because he built things like the Second Temple. There was a massive harbor in Caesarea uh, that he constructed to build these massive buildings. He greatly levied the taxes. Uh, so you can already see the conversations around what's a true building. How's, what does he mean by Peter being the, the cornerstone? What does he mean by all these things about stumbling blocks? Literally, you know, stones on the, there's a lot of building images, building the kingdom of God. Herod is famous for building things. And of course, the tax collectors seen as, as great villains. And of course, he would bolster his reputation by spending vast amounts of wealth, wealth he acquired through taxation, and he would spend that wealth on people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees because the Jewish authorities didn't take him seriously, and that was a way of being taken seriously was by paying them a lot of money. And when he died, uh, and he died of a really horrific illness, um, including gangrene, and great riots broke out all over the kingdom, and some say that all the, 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 the anger and tension and uh, pain that he caused in his 34 years ultimately resulted in a riot that destroyed Jerusalem in, in 70. So we have this interesting man, this interesting biography, where it seems like a lot of the themes that we encounter in the New Testament, um, he himself raised. And then we encounter John the Baptist. And John the Baptist wrestles with these themes in a very different way from Jesus. One of the big themes that, that King Herod raises is 
the theme of outsiders and insiders. Who, who is in and who is out? He's not really Jewish, according to the Pharisees, because he's not from Judea. You can see the same thing from Jesus. And we see the gospel writers wrestling with this, where you know, Matthew says, well, he's not really from Galilee. He's actually, he was born in Bethlehem, and he moved there when he was very young. The gospel of John says it doesn't even matter. Um, but this is a theme that comes up. And so we have, we have John the Baptist approaching these themes in a very interesting way. He says we're all outsiders. Every one of us doesn't fit. Everybody doesn't belong. None of us are supposed to be here, and so we need to get out. We need to get out in the wilderness and escape. Who should be in charge? Who should really be the king of the Jews? For John the Baptist, we shouldn't have any kings. We shouldn't have any kind of authority ruling over us. Let's go into the wilderness and follow God. There should be no temporal authority on earth. King Herod, uh, both Herods, lived a really uh, immoral life. They made a lot of really terrible decisions. Um, I kept, I, I know it's side of the times, but I kept, as I was reading about all this stuff, I kept thinking about Rob Ford. <laughs> as sort of a modern analog. And, you know, because Rob Ford's argument is that, well, I've, I've, I've reduced taxes, I've built all this infrastructure, I've, I'm, I've been building all of these things, I've been very responsible fiscally, and you have the world saying, yeah, but somehow there has to be morality in, in your role as leader along with everything else. For John the Baptist, he believes in moral purity. And again, we retreat into the wilderness, surrounded by people who are baptized and cleansed and purified so we can all live a moral life together. And we don't build a kingdom. We wait for God because God is going to come and build a kingdom to be uh, to be among us and with us. And we're going to win. We're going to win. That's John the Baptist's final message. And this is why he gets so frustrated with Jesus. Because he's been arrested. He's on death's row. He's clearly not winning. Can you really be the real Messiah? He's saying to Jesus. So then we have Jesus. Jesus. For John the Baptist, we're all outsiders. For, G for Jesus, we're all insiders. We're all a part of the same family. For Jesus, for John the Baptist, kings don't matter. For Jesus, kings do matter. Who is in charge is important. Jesus doesn't go to the wilderness. He makes a beeline right for Jerusalem. And Paul, and following Jesus in the, in the church, heads straight for Rome. For Jesus, authority matters. Who are the Pharisees and what are they saying? That matters. Who are the temple priests? What are they saying? That matters. Today, who's the prime minister? Who's the governor general? Who's, uh, all of these things matter to Jesus. But ultimately, God is king. And God has rulership over the earth. But authority matters. For Jesus, like John, morality matters. Living a moral life matters. But for John, he headed out into the wilderness. For Jesus, he heads straight into the cities, into the rough areas of the cities. And he surrounds himself by immorality. John, I don't think John believed that that was, gonna, that was possible. There's no way that that's not going to corrupt you. We must be cleansed and be safe. Jesus says, no. What's going to cleanse us is forgiveness. That's going to keep us clean. Love, hope, forgiving those people who have hurt you, that is what is going to cleanse your heart. So I'm going to have dinner with tax collectors. And you can imagine the scandal, right? Because you have a king like uh, King Herod who's making all these horribly immoral decisions, like a Rob Ford doing crack. And Jesus says, well, I'm going to hang out with crackheads because they need forgiveness possibly more than I do. Very different than John the Baptist, who would probably have nothing to do with them. For John the Baptist, you can't build anything. You have to wait for God to build. And for Jesus, we are all building the kingdom of God together. In a very powerful way, we are the kingdom of God. He says, Peter, you are the cornerstone. His name, Peter, means rock. Upon this stone, upon this petros, this Peter, I will build my church, right? He's using lots of building images. For Jesus, we are building the kingdom right now. We don't need a King Herod to build us a temple. We don't need to look to Rome. 
we ourselves can build the kingdom. We don't have to wait. We don't have to sit around and wait for God in the wilderness until God's armies come and we can recapture Jerusalem. We can become the kingdom of God right now. And for Jesus, we're not going to win. We're probably, it's going to look to the world like we lose. If you were to take up your cross that is unique to you, if you were to take up your cross and follow Jesus in the eyes of the world, you are losing, and they will probably call you a loser. And that would frustrate someone like John the Baptist that wants to see change. He wants to see it. And we do too. But there's a difference between seeing the world through the eyes of the kingdom of God and through the eyes of a great sporting victory. So through the eyes of Jesus, we, in the traditional sense, we're not going to win. We're probably going to lose. And we're going to encounter the kingdom of God through our losing. Very different. That's why we see at the end, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. He was a great and powerful and heroic man. And yet, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Very different. And so there's this dialogue that seems to happen every Advent between, between King Herod, who is a very powerful voice in today's world as well. I don't see what the problem is. I'm building great infrastructure. What, what, why does my personal life matter? I'm just building all these great and powerful and wonderful things. I'm deferring to great and powerful people. We have the voice of John the Baptist, who, who, who still has a voice in our church and should have a voice in our church, saying, we need to get out of here. We need to get out into the wilderness and prepare We need to retreat and regroup and refocus and find out who are the people that love us and the people that are trying to hurt us. Sometimes we need to do that and retreat. But Jesus is saying, fine, Jesus himself retreats into the wilderness and is baptized with John. But Jesus is saying, but ultimately we're going to return, we're going to go into the heart of Jerusalem, we're going to surround ourselves with tax collectors and crack addicts, and all those various people, and we will forgive, and we will love, and we will hope with them, and we will eat and drink with them, and we will herald the coming of the kingdom of God that is to be built with love and hope and forgiveness, not with stones. So I, along with you, cannot wait for Christmas as we herald the coming of uh, Jesus Christ. Amen.